tonight is the second lecture of ours for this academic year, and we've got the pleasure and privilege of Mark Duhan, the mind maelstrom that is Mark Duhan, friend, wonderful <laughs> human being. So Mark graduated in theology and religious studies from Oxford, has completed a master's in religion, uh, religion and society at Durham. He's been a lay chaplain, he's currently applying for a doctorate in psychedelic theology. <laughs> Almost. Almost <laughs> correct, right? He's interested in the relationship between drugs and culture, specifically the potential of augmenting religion with ritual and theogenesis, and has presented at international conferences such as Greenwich University's own Breaking Convention and Girl Psychedelics. Today he'll be talking with us about psychedelic mysticism and ritual, the dialectic of duty and experience, and the dilemma between individualism and collectivism. So please give me a warm welcome. <laughs> so as all these talks begin, I thought I'd start with a Terence McKenna quote. Um, this is one of the <coughs> concluding remarks in his book, Food for the Gods. Terence argues, we have lost the ability to be swayed by the power of myths, and our history should convince us of the fallacy of dogma. What we require is a new dimension of self-experience that individually and collectively authenticates democratic social theories and our stewardship of this small part of the larger universe. The discovery of such a dimension will mean risk and opportunity. Seeking the answer is the stance of the ingenue, the pre-initiate and the fool. We must now have done with such posturing it is for us to face the answer. Facing the answer means recognizing that the world we have prepared to hand on to the generations of the future is no more than a mess of broken pottage. It is not the dispossessed people in the ruined rainforest who are pathetic. It is not the stoic opium farmers of tribal Burma who menace distant hopes and populations. It is ourselves. With this not-so-new psychedelic dawn, there has been much hope for the destiny of our world. In this discourse in particular, there is so much hope, from ecological awareness raising to prison recidivism rate uh, reduction, from depression and addiction treatments to the active overcoming of death fear among uh, uh, the dying in our hospices, uh, from greater connectivity between spirits and humans, um, to complex system problem solving of the world's ecological and uh, political crises. From a greater compassion of the first world to the third world and a deeper <coughs> authenticity to those in power, we all hope. All these things we stand perhaps to gain. Or do we? The guiding logic of this talk uh, will be taken from the Hashishim. For those who don't know, these were a group uh, during the High Middle Ages, during the Crusades, who took on assassin contracts, dealt in hash, and their name lends itself to the etymology of the word assassin. That's right, we get assassin from hashish. Peace and love, anyone? <laughs> all, all these things. Um, we stand to gain, but... <laughs> This is uh, a quote from uh, the founder of the regime, and it does appear in the video game, yes, Assassin's Creed. Mm -hmm. Nothing is true, everything is permitted. Now, if we slightly change that, I, I want to question in this talk, and I'm not going to come to a conclusion, but I would like us to consider the idea that if nothing is true, then is everything permitted? In posher terms, does intellectual acatalepsy or the radical skeptical doctrine that true knowledge, capital T, is impossible, lead inevitably to a kind of moral anomie or a lawlessness. What we believe about how the world works has some kind of impact on how we should act in the world, um, would be my intuition. In Kantian terms, our Vernunft and our Verstand support each other. So our Verstand, our understanding or knowledge that, impacts our vernunft, to our way of knowing, our reason, our rationality, our way of acting and morally reasoning. I would say that seems intuitive, but we'll see. Epistemology, um, the study of knowledge and morality, the study of right and wrong, 
are connected. Metaphysics and ethics also connect each other. Our worldview and our ethos, to use more social scientific terms, perhaps connect each other. <coughs> According to Gibbs, the worldview, Clifford Gibbs, is the picture people have the way things in sheer actuality are, their most comprehensive ideas of order. And then there's the ethos, the tone and character and quality of their life, uh, its moral and aesthetic style and mood. Now to me these seem not purely separate categories, but co-mingling and uh, co-effective, if that makes sense. Um, they are theoretically separable, uh, but what we know and how we act um, and being in the world involves a, a, a complementary back and forth between what we think is the case and what we do in that case. So the other theoretical tidbit is this concept of sacrament. It's very much a word bandied around in psychedelic culture. In theological, which is where the word comes from, in, in the theological discourse it's defined as an outward and visible sign of an inward and spiritual grace. It's not necessarily something that gets you high, or either something that you just enact, but it is a physical sign of a spiritual reality. So, now that the theoretical bit is done, I'm going to go to a story. This is a story I heard during my social study uh, as a master's student, and it's deeply affected the way I think about these issues. It's the story of Will. Um, at 15 years of age, Will had been disillusioned by life already. He had gone to boarding school, was forced to go to chapel, not that he believed much of it. He remembers staring out the window in the countless days as a child and thinking, this is the world, this is the world and it's grey. Then Will discovered weed. <laughs> and with that came something more than the drab, the humdrum, the everyday. After weed came speed, and um, thereafter the combination. Uh, when he discovered acid, that sealed the deal. He found a way to transcend. He then embarked in a process of ingesting acid taps every day for months on end, spending time by himself in big UK cities, tripping hard, smoking with speed combined. Where's Will now? Will is now a member of a Pentecostal Christian community, and he considers Buddha, yoga, and the yin-yang to be evil and demonic. <laughs> he was brought as far away from God as it was possible to go through his LSD use. Taking a tab every day for a month by himself, away from friends and family, he was taken on a journey centering on a UFO conspiracy and the coming of the Antichrist, whom he eventually became, or felt he became. He began to see his new age pick and mix faith as evil and the psychedelic bands he liked as demon summoners. Responding to the constant voices in his head, you will never be saved, you will never be saved. His parents decided he'd see a psychologist. Uh, psychiatric drugs and an Anglican exorcism followed this, but even these were not enough to dull the constantly <coughs> uttering voices in his head. Now, reflecting on this, Will told me that LSD, in his mind, opens you up spiritually, but not necessarily to the good stuff, I quote. He became hooked on the difference and pressured himself to being the center of defining the universe. It was the stricture of the Christian faith which brought him back and stopped the voices. Eventually, in his own words, he could feel God rebuilding his brain. He reached a moment where he couldn't decide on any single metaphysical system and was driven mad by the choice of which reality to pick. And I'm quoting now, acid takes you up into orbit, you're just touching the edge of space, but if you give yourself enough oomph, you can actually get beyond the pull of gravity, he says. And that's where I got to. I was actually at the point where I was like, I'd actually like to come back to reality now, but which one do I choose? He said, although I was hungry for something more, it was kind of on my terms. The ethic was vaguely conceived in this free festival culture he lived in as goodness. There was no kind of moral code. Um, people it kind of excused people to do whatever they want um, because they didn't want to step on each other's toes. But what does this mean? In spite of Will's cynicism about Hindu mantras, eventual cynicism, it was the repetitive Christian statements which helped him to curtail the voices in his head. In his head, I should say. <laughs> uh, the Lord's Prayer. <laughs> the Lord's Prayer, the recommendation from his local priest to just keep saying, I claim the victory of the cross, I came to claim the victory of the cross. Uh, a Bible reading of a Jesus healing at which the statement, be clean, 
stop the voices even further. But most importantly, it, it was the loving community of a Bible study and regular worship. So Well had adopted a, what theologians would call a scripturalist position, a close or near identical association of God with scripture. So what scripturalists claim is that the holy text in question, in Will's, Will's case the Bible, the Christian Bible, it is the only portal to divine knowledge, the only way God communicates to humankind, and the only way for homo sapiens to know anything about God. In Alan Watts's famous critique, we could say that he was eating paper currency. But this hippie-go-lucky perspective, it would say that Will's world had become smaller, um, and in his acceptance uh, of his scripturalist faith. Uh, this is a judgment I will leave hanging in the air. Maybe, maybe not. As we all know, who knows? Uh, but what is certain is that scripturalism is probably one of the most pervasive barriers to dialogue between faiths, between science and faith, and so it is a force that needs to be taken seriously. Will's story is indicative, and there are countless Similar of a similar ilk in the 1984 ethnography Getting Saved from the 60s, which is a great book, and for a conclusion, I'm, I'm ha I have to re I recommend, I'm afraid I have to recommend my talk, because I conclude it in my, in my talk this year in summer, 2019 Breaking Convention, but it's an amazing book, Getting Saved from the 60s. But what is certain in this case is that the intellectual catalepsy, the inability to reach certainty provoked by LSD, was intimately connected with a perceived moral anomaly. Um, as the potential universes he was perceiving grew so large as to become limitless, what he thought he ought to do in the world became pointless. As his understanding of the world reached breaking point, so his motivation to act in the world became purposeless. And this was because all that was going on was him and a drug. Contrast this now to Mr. John Crow. In a society more and more afraid of admitting wrongdoing and asking for forgiveness, imagine if a church whose Bishop of Winchester, the best part of a thousand years ago, gave the rights to sex workers in Southwark to solicit sex under what was called the liberty of the clink, before burying them in unconsecrated ground destined for hell, and then, a thousand years later, apologised for it on every Mary Magdalene day, the best part of a millennium later, one day per year, for over a decade, in a ritual act of regret and remembrance. You don't have to imagine it, it happened. This church that these, this, is the church of St Mary Overy, near Crossbones, who's the matron saint of beggars, whores and ferrymen, and was actually built on or near the old temple to Isis, the goddess of rebirth, this happened, and LSD was part of the melting pot of ingredients that realised this occasion. This didn't happen, though, without some serious, what I will term and explain later, psycho-spiritual triangulation. John took years setting up the psychic architecture for this event, trained in mediumship, gave up drugs, studied this historical period um, to make himself open to the ghost of one of these Winchester geese, these, these prostitutes, um, these sex workers, revealing the hidden divinity in providing such service, the sacrifice involved in being divinity. The final catalyst for this process was, yes, an LSD flood dose. The dose um, revealed to him, <coughs> with everything else, the geographical location of this graveyard since lost to history, and within a few months, the Jubilee Line workers were digging electricity pylons down into the earth in that area, and they discovered thousands of undeterred human skeletons, many children. And here, a spirit has told him about the geographical location of a graveyard, and it's triangulated then by this world for human beings. So this is, is an example of, probably an example of psychedelics going well. I would say, <laughs> so, something like that. I mean, another informant of mine, I won't go into any more than these, but he got over his heroin ad addiction through a flood dose of DMT. But what made him get over it was a visceral feeling of social bonds, of how he was screwing over his friends and family. His relationships had lay in tatters because of his abuse. And when he saw it from their perspective, in this relational way, um, he, got a, he, he, he was given the strength to, to get over his heroin addiction. I mean, we've found, heard countless stories about this, and this talk isn't largely about these stories. Um, but
But these true stories did lead me to develop my theory of socio-spiritual triangulation. So, on the most basic level, concrete and embodied familiarity and trust, friendship, helps to establish the spiritual. With spirits and visions, um, consensus reality is not just guarded through sociality in the physical, but also in the unseen world. So this apple is a spirit. There's me, myself, and my, my other self, and other self. So the potential universes seen on psychedelics, to which I would refer you to Gallimore's essay, DMT and the Topology of Reality, in the second breaking book. They are made less multifarious by the consensus of others. So what, what I kind of uncovered is this timeless truth that where individuals create their spiritual world, groups discover their spiritual world. Um, so intersubjectivity is, some, is more real than subjectivity. Objectivity, perhaps impossible, who knows? But intersubjectivity adds a certain reality to the unseen. So, um, so the social here in this socio-spiritual triangulation can be the most basic thing. I've seen a graveyard, it's been corroborated by some builders. Or you and your friend have a trip out together, like Terence McKenna and his brother. Or, or your motivations are social, or the fruits are social, which in the case of Crossbones Graveyard, all three. Now I hope this makes sense. But you can ask me afterwards if it doesn't, but we must move on. <laughs> um, now that I've perhaps established that the relationship between worldview and ethos, I will now sketch out what I understand by the terms mysticism and ritual. Because I think these these are words that I used a lot in this in this cult in this um, discourse. So then after that I will draw it all together and we can start to pick holes in my horror story. But um, but after establishing mysticism and ritual, what we mean by those, I'm going to look at another example of a, of a horror dark cult, and then finish off with the utopian dreams of the 60s and collectivism and ch actually changing the world, which is hopefully what we all want to do. So mysticism is a term kind of considered by some to be so broad as to be meaningless, and by others to be so common as to be ubiquitous among the religions. To some, it means nothing but a series of unrelated specificities. To others, it represents the common core or the, ex or the experience of all religion. So that's what an atheistic Zen Buddhist will experience is the same as a Roman Catholic or any number of native spiritualities. People see mysticism as kind of uniting these. It's a bit like the term shamanism. It describes a complex confluence of factors within all religions, all culminating in one what might call a peak or unitive experience where the death of death is life and where light ceases to be light without shadow, where Alan Watts once more has a field day, basically. <laughs> so um, Evelyn Underhill, an Anglican mystic of the 19th century, wrote this beautiful conclusion. She, she said... Though philosophy has striven since thought began and striven in vain to res resolve the paradox of being and becoming of eternity and time, she has failed strangely enough to perceive that a certain type of personality has substituted experience for her guesses of truth and achieved its solution not by the dubious processes of thought, but by direct perception. So what has come to be termed the common core thesis um, was actually taught to me at undergrad as coming from Germany. Um, that's kind of true, because this guy wrote an amazing, this Schleiermacher fella, wrote a, a, in, in 1799, he wrote an apology for Christianity, apologia in the Greek sense, a, a justification. To call it speeches on religion to its culture despises. The contemplation of spiritual men, sick, is only the immediate consciousness of the universal being all finite things in and through the infinite, of all temporal things in and through the eternal. To seek and to find this infinite and eternal factor in all that lives and moves, in all growth and change, in all action and passion, and to have and to know life itself only in immediate feeling, that is religion. And so religion is a life in the infinite nature of the whole, the one and the all in God, a having and possessing of all in God and of God in all. Eleven years earlier, oh no, before, this, this is kind of like, yeah, eleven years earlier, William Blake actually said something quite similar. He didn't flesh it out, though, with words, as he did in Germany. He fleshed it out with pictures, 
Um, the true method of knowledge is the experiment. The true faculty of knowing must be the faculty which experiences. All men are alike, though infinitely various. So all religions have one source. If it were not for the poetic character, the philosophic and experimental would soon be at the ratio of all things and stand still, unable to do other than repeat the same dull round over again. He who sees the infinite in all things sees God. He who sees only the re ratio or the reason sees himself only. God becomes as we are, that we may be as he is sick. So, then of course there's this whole this whole hippie, hippie thing, this psychedelic thing, what about Dimitri? What about the fact that in our minds, or in all of our brains, I should say, not minds, because the brain isn't necessarily a mind, there is DMT knocking around. Um, so that is both really, really quite woolly as well, and I just want to take this moment just to explain how inspiring and how woolly it is. So. This has led to a lot of new age glossing over, basically, which has irritated the academic study of religion. We've heard it before. The individual Atman and the universal Brahman are just like the Buddha mind, which is just like the sacrifice of self for other in Christ, which is just like the surrender of Islam, which is just like what shamans have always been doing, like the shaman Moses and the DMT acacia tree. We've heard it so many times. I... And there's always DMT knocking around in the brain. Um, so why would this not be a common experience? And of course that's true. But ironically, this field of mysticism actually has a lot of categorizers. It's been picked apart. So um, Rudolf Otto, in his book, The Idea of the Holy, described the religious experience as the mysterium tremendum et facens, or the fearful, terrifying mystery which, hold, which holds one in awe of the spectacle of existence. Um, this otherness is both entirely alien to our truest self, um, so, scholars now have distinguished between mystical states and numinous states. In, the numinous is the experience of the completely transcendently other. The mystical is the self experienced as the, the transcendently other. States, in his book, Mysticism and Philosophy, refer to both introverted and extroverted mi mysticism. Um, Introverted mysticism, perhaps the dazzling darkness of Meister Eckhart, if any of you are familiar with him, looks inward towards the calm, serene, philosophical mind. There are special techniques of introversion which differ only slightly and superficially in different cultures, he says on page 61. Extroverted mysticism, on the other hand, tends to be characterized by what the senses themselves perceive outwardly and can be compared to Buddhist insight or wisdom meditation or um, Lexio Divina in Catholicism. So such a mysticism sees a unity in multi multiplicity, one underlying the many. Um, it's characterized by paradoxicality. Um, like things are not dead but have a living presence. Um, it's more often than not, not spontaneous, if that makes sense. So Stace lumps the experience of mescaline, for example, in with extroverted mysticism. And he quotes someone, everything was urgent with life, with, which was the same in the cat, the wasp, the broken bottle, and it manifested itself differently in these individuals, but was at the same time urgent with life. So introverted mysticism involves the pre-conscious affect of the extinguishing of self, and thus a collapsing of identity into non-identity, or a retraction of consciousness into non-consciousness, whereas extroverted mysticism expands itself into the totality of all experience, and thus involves an expansion, uh, yeah, an expansion of consciousness. Zena, who we're going to come back to later, differentiates between God and nature mysticism. Um, God mysticism, he argued, although I disagree with this part, but he argued characterizes Western mysticism because there's still a, an ultimate boundary between the self and God, although that is unified in love. Whereas nature mysticism um, collapses the infinite nature of the universe and the self into one. So the self and nature are one, the self and God are kind of one but not quite, is the difference between them. But of course, nature mysticism, thanks to the psychedelic movement, now exists in the West, and a lot of Hindu scholars, I think, adopt a, a form of God mysticism, but this is besides the point. The category itself is perhaps useful. St 
Stephen Katz, this is the most damning, uh, taking from a long line of linguistic constructivists, was, uh, as theology was wont in the 80s, made another perhaps most damning distinction of all, and that is that of the experiential and the literary. So to Katz, comparing Christian and Asian mystics and shamans was, was a misnomer because in Europe those works were nestled in Jewish and Greek scripture and philosophy, and in Asia the literary influences were Vedic, Buddhist, Taoist, you get the picture. So for Katz, these works are primarily literary works that seek to bring the reader into some form of communion with their scripture, and at most uh, a, um, a de deconstruction of categories. But because the very words being used have different intellectual histories and different uses through time, it cannot be said that these texts are trying to teach us about some pre-linguistic experience. The notion of which cannot exist anyway, according to Katz, because when you experience something, you're always already interpreting it. So language is always uh, somehow building our world in some way. Uh, mystics are writing literature. Now, I hear you cry. <laughs> no, I don't, actually. I hear you cry. Isn't there an irony in categorizing an experience that demolishes the categories of world and idea, language and silence, self and other? Nick Land, <laughs> horror story, in his book Fang to Numina, really recommend, um, trace the etymology of the word categorized to the Greek kategoreo. And sorry, some of my friends, I apologize if your ears are running shit to water right now, but kategoreo, you hear it. It's, a, it's an accusation. And it's in some senses not useful. But the reason, oh, the reason I brought this up is that we frame work, the world in terms of the religious concepts we have ingested. And whether these concepts themselves come from the beyond is another question, and I would be the last to deny that the word neuron is itself a concept. Uh, and, you know, um, reality is just a word. That's what one of my friends said the other day. But religious language is important, and it do if it does not generate or exclusively generate our experience, then it does necessarily frame our experience as we can only speak of it, or not at all. So, um, let's go back to Alan Watts now. Let's have a refreshing Watts session. The constant awareness of death shows the world to be as flowing and diaphanous as the filmy patterns of blue smoke in the air. That there really is nothing to clutch, and no one to clutch it. This is depressing only so long as there remains a notion that there might be some way of fixing it, of putting it off just once more, or hoping that one has, or is, some kind of ego soul that will survive bodily dissolution. I'm not saying that there is no personal continuity beyond death, only that believing it keeps us in bondage. There is no more saying that we ought not to fear death than I was saying that we ought to be unselfish. Suppressing the fear of death makes it all the stronger. The point is only to know, beyond any shadow of doubt, that I and other things now present will vanish until this knowledge compels you to release them, to know it now as surely as you had just fallen off the rim of the Grand Canyon. Indeed, you were kicked off the edge of a precipice when you were born, and it's no help to cling to the rocks falling with you. If you're afraid of death, be afraid. The point is to get with it, to let it take over. Fe featuring ghosts, pains, transients, dissolution, and all and then comes the hitherto unbelievable surprise. You don't die because you were never born. You'd just forgotten who you were. Um, but to many in the counterculture, this intellectual, what I call intellectual mystication, wasn't cutting the mustard. Why do I call it mystication rather than mystification? I think Alan Watts has got a point. And I think he helps individuals deal with death. Uh, when I went through an atheistic phase, he brought me back, even though he's quite an atheist theologian himself. So I have a lot of gratitude for Alan Watts. But it's intellectual mystication, mastication, masturbation, you know what I mean? It's like, it's something to chew on, certainly, but does it actually change things? It helps us individuals, right? Does it change the culture? Does it change the co collectivity? 
So in this amazing essay, which I really recommend, it basically sealed the deal that the hippies are evil. Um, <coughs> Joan Didion's Slouching Towards Bethlehem, reference to W.B. Yeats' poem, she reported that the tensions between the new left and those who just wanted to have a good time, there were these huge tensions. The former would parade billboards around Hyde Ashbury saying things like, how many times you've been raped, you love freaks? And they wrote posters, pretty little 16-year-old middle-class chick comes to the hate to see what it's, hate Ashbury, to see what it's all about and gets picked up by 17-year-old street dealer who spends all day shooting her full of speed again and again, then feeds her 3,000 mites and raffles off her temporarily unemployed body for the biggest height street gangbang since the night before last. The politics and ethics of ecstasy. Rape is as common as bullshit on hate street. Kids are starving on the street. Minds and bodies being maimed as we watch a scale model of Vietnam. And this is provocative. <laughs> <laughs> this summer, thousands of unwhite, unsuburban boppers are going to want to know why you've given up on what they can't get and how you get away with it, and how come you're not a faggot with hair so long, and they want hate street one way or another. If you don't know, by August, hate street will be a cemetery. Horror. Yippie's founder of the Youth Independent Party, um, he was also critical of the hippies. Lay off the needle drugs, the only dope worth shooting is Richard Nixon. There is absolutely no greater high than challenging the power structures as a nobody, giving it your all, and winning. Smoking dope and hanging up Jay's picture is no more a commitment than drinking milk and collecting postage stamps. <laughs> you measure democracy by the freedom it gives its dissidents, not the freedom it gives its assimilated conformists. So what's ri what is ritual then? The discipline of anthropology in its attempt to scientifically examine collective human behaviour has placed emphasis on the function of ritual. Nevertheless, as always with any interpretative endeavour, the hermeneutic or the way they interpret um, these <coughs> ritual events um, have in no small part reflected the gaze of the anthropologist um, him or herself. Uh, and thus, yes, in the words of Hegel, evil is in the eye of the beholder. And so we must take all these theories as covering an angle on truth from the perspective of two ears, two noses, no, one body and one brain in time and space. So Durkheim argued that rituals have the function of social integration, made the ontological claim that God experiences are an epiphenomenon of society. So Freud was like, God is an epiphenomenon of the brain. Durkheim said, Freud is an epiphenomenon of society. God experience, religious experience in ritual is just society worshipping itself, basically. And I personally wouldn't accept this opinion because there's no way to verify it, but his conception of effervescence is something that I will take into this talk. So what he argued is, when a group of people come together and they repetitively intone words and enact embodied movements, a, a, a certain transcendency occurs, allowing not only a collective bonding, but also for the individual to feel that they have transcended the shackles of their prosaity, <laughs> their identity. So functionalist claims about what ritual do, does for society, I think, are quite interesting, but I won't comment on his anti-metaphysical claim that rituals actually point towards nothing, because I don't think they do, but we can talk about that in the pub later. Um, Rappaport, in his book Ritual and Religion in the Making of Humanity, develops this concept further, and he's often contrasted to a guy called Maurice Bloch. So, Maurice Bloch argues that rituals exist in order to establish hierarchies, um, and they are, in principle, undesirable in a, in a liberal society. Rituals, Bloch argued, are diabolical smoke screens, basically, initiated by a priesthood to keep the powerful in power and the powerless under their authority. This resonates with Turner's famous idea that rituals exist in liminal, sociocultural spaces betwixt and between, where infants can be kings just for a few minutes, and hierarchical structures are temporarily <coughs> dissolved to develop a sense of importance um, for the simultaneous contingency and necessity of, of hierarchy itself, temporarily in the ritual. Um, high, you, know, you can dissolve the hierarchy. So high would not be high unless low existed, and he who is high must experience what it is like to be low. An appropriate quote, I think, um, given the 
polyvalent nature of the word high. There is truth in the conception of ritual as hierarchizing, but unlike um, Turner, Bloch's emphasis is through a critical lens. He said we need to outgrow the need for rituals in a society. Rappaport, whom I love, and you should read the book, sees the primary function or meta-function of liturgical ritual performance as not to control behavior directly, but to establish conventional understandings and rules and norms in accordance with which everyday behavior is supposed to proceed. So rituals cannot enforce values, uh, and I would agree with him, but rituals do define values. So it's not ritual's office to ensure compliance, but to establish obligation. If internal in agreement from each individual were necessary, it would likely turn non or into a kind of non-order or disorder, given the near impossibility of meeting such a standard. Um, private states are likely to be volatile, he says, to the conventions to which we are subordinate. So the first office of rituals is a performance. So this renders it the social basic, the basic social act. They nevertheless have morality intrinsic to them, relying on acceptance more than they do on belief. So cross-culturally, a breach of ritual obligation is what's considered wrong, right? We think that morals are relative to the society in which we exist. And to some extent, that's true. But it's also true that in every society, if you breach an ethic, if you bre breach a ritual code that is immoral, whatever the ritual code is, they might differ. So, um, what I would argue, so for, is that in the in this context, entheogen states that the state of um, meeting divinity or spirituality in with psychedelics, um, without the embedding of ritual, uh, can become morally chaotic. Because, as we shall see, they can dissolve as much as they can create new epistemic or knowledge structures. Um, so just to juggle these concepts with a few direct quotations from our psychedelic forefathers, Leary said that the <laughs> 60s were a naive romantic time, excited by the notion that we humans could fly, cut loose from the synaptic cords that held us to low levels of mentation. We soared into uncharted realms of the brain, but we were on our own. Western psychological literature had almost no guides, no maps, no texts that even recognized the existence of altered states. We had no rituals, traditions, or comforting routines to fall back on. Boring. Um, I mean, let's just go also to Terence McKenna, yeah? Because he argues this also in Food of the Gods, but in an amazing essay called Psychedelic Society, I think he was one of the arch-individualists of our, of our time, but he wrote an essay called Psychedelic Society. And he said the psychedelics are a red-hot social ethical issue precisely because they are deconditioning agents. They will raise doubts in you if you're a Hasidic Jew, a Marxist anthropologist, or an altar boy, because their business is to dissolve belief systems, he argued. They do this very well, and then they leave you with the raw datum of experience. But of course, Terence McKenna never, never spent any time with, with natives. He, he, he took these drugs, just him and his brother. Um, and although he was incredibly cultured and incredibly well-read, uh, that's why they were deconditioning agents for him, because he'd read the postmodernists, right? I mean, maybe it's a facile argument, but in, uh, in this amazing book, Drugs, Mysticism, and Make-Belief, Zayna argues that irrational fear is an inevitable reaction to drugs. Where hippies had a legitimate grievance, regarding the sad lack of religious experiences in our society. The hippies were simultaneously blind to the fact that the molecules with which they sought to solve this problem were, in effect, a continuation of this technologized and individualist thinking. The fear of technology is instinctually and irrationally based, he says, on the threat they are perceived to have on the soul. The psychedelic trip, he says, however cozy the set and setting appears, is an extension of the soulless technology to the soul itself. Canned food, canned houses, canned music, and now canned mysticism, stimulated by canned music. Of course this reaction is irrational, but it is deep-seated. 
Many hippies never gained an awareness of psychedelics as molecular technologies, which, like all technologies, require a telos, or an end, in order to not to become self-consuming. Will Rowlandson interprets Zena's argument. Zena argued not from the phenomenological position of whether mystical states are possible with psychedelics, but whether they are permissible. And although it never explicitly stated, it seems that this is the leaning of his rhetoric. Zena very much accepted the criticism of Leary that baptism and Eucharist and all these traditional Christian rituals could be boring, contrived performances which all too often did not succeed in altering the consciousness of individuals in the long or short term. He also accepted that LSD might do this much more quickly. His chief contention, and I think this is an important nuance, and for me, if you take anything with you tonight, it's this. It is more difficult to be baptized and be changed by that, and have that change you, than a psychedelic. A psychedelic will inevitably change you. And that's not to say that psychedelic states are easy in themselves, but it is to say that they are ine inevitably life-changing. Um, the work which the individual has to do in terms of regulating and routinizing his or her life in the sober rhythm of the Christian sacraments is radically different. Um, with the excitement of psychedelics, the end can become the drug state itself rather than the lessons that are learned. So Will, this informant, put, in, put it tellingly, I was hooked on the difference. So what psychedelics can offer is an authenticity to rituals, which is why Santa Dime is taking off, why um, people, uh, why the religious side of this whole movement is um, something that people yearn for. Rituals, conversely, can cease to be perceived as fake performances. Mysticism can be democratized. Rituals cease to be boring. Great. But is there a flip side? Is there a flip side to this? I'm afraid there is. And it can be summarized in Alistair Crowley's statement. We place no reliance on virgin or pigeon. Our method is science. Our aim is religion. So religion can now be placed on the petri dish, poked, prodded, measured even, but most certainly reforged. And there is a danger in this heady mix of science and religion. I will not deny. Uh, before I go on, actually, I wanted to find these books. If anyone has any access to them, please message me. Does anyone know who this guy is? In 1995, a few months before I was born, Ong Shin Rikyo were discovered to be responsible for the sarin nerve gas attack on a busy commuter train, killing 19 Tokyo commuters and injuring thousands more. The nerve agent they used was developed in the laboratories also synthesizing LSD and amphetamine. The quote, um, so previously to this, countless suspect deaths pinned on random, well-framed innocents were finally seen in the telling pattern of those who had been openly critical to the cult Om Shin Rikyo, founded by Shoko Asahara. Om Shin Rikyo not only used psychedelics in their initiation and other rituals, but promulgated a syncretic Buddhist Christian millenarian worldview. And when I learned this, I was astounded, because I'm a Christian Buddhist who dabbles. Um, and so, that on such on paper, such evil could propagate a worldview kind of similar to my own was enough to cause some serious horripilation. What's crazy is that some scholars have measured their membership increase throughout the 80s and 90s as representing the fastest spreading religious grouping in Japan. How did it start? I shit, I shit you not, a yoga meditation center. It starts into some yoga meditation center. An innocent evening's meditation turned into a cult trying to accelerate the apocalypse. It's a crazy story. Asahara incorporated Christian ideas into Buddhism that appealed to the educated Japanese middle class, whose exposure to American and Western culture over the last half century had impacted their understanding of spiritual horizons. Shoko Asahara believed it was Ong Shinrikyo's duty to bring about, about the final Armageddon in the form of a third world war against the beast from the Book of Revelation, cast as the United States of America, through making their leader, um, Shoko Asahara, Emperor of Japan. Now dubbed uh, a dangerous terrorist organization by the Russian Federation, European Union, USA, and other states and state groups, 
the cult's offshoots still exist under heavy surveillance in Japan, under the rights of freedom of religion, called Aleph. Sorry, just quickly, how did this start? Yeah, the yoga meditation center. Now, describing these horror stories is not for the purpose of saying that psychedelics are evil. Uh, I'm describing evil people with evil intentions to manipulate the vulnerable. This is the story of any cult. But the fact that psychedelics had their part, part to play, indeed perhaps a crucial role to play in opening up people's, um, um, in opening people up, I don't know, in the mass convincing of people towards acts of violence means that psychedelics do not automatically make you a better person. And I know that's a platitude, but they are tools. They're not morally neutral. That is to say they're tools. They're not morally neutral. They can be good, they can be bad. Um, if I have a gun in my pocket, it changes the moral landscape of the room regardless. You, you know, a tool is not morally neutral. In the closing chapter of his book, William Leonard Picard writes a demonography, basically, of this man Skinner, I don't know if you guys have heard of him, um, who is kind of a, almost a cult leader. Um, after Picard's imprisonment, Skinner proceeded to lure the lover of one of his polyamorous relationships into a hotel room um, inject him with novel tryptamines and slowly castrate him. This is torture enhanced. Enhanced by those non-specific amplifiers we tout as nature-connective, trauma-releasing, category-demolishing. This is torture made worse by drugs, which in could, in principle, save the world, right? So I've mentioned these psychedelic rules from the past to illustrate uh, and would mention the ones who exist today were it not for the inherent danger in publicly denouncing the black magicians who are still alive. Um, there are organizations akin to this today, online ayahuasca shops, international networks which lie about spending, who fiscally and sexually exploit the vulnerable and pliable. And one practitioner in recent years has been invited to conferences after filmed evidence of the use of tasers during 5-MEO. Um, why would you join a cult? Though a perennial feature of culture and a constant cause of human suffering through the course of history, the question is especially relevant today. We live in an era where information, both true and questionable, has never been more accessible. Yet truth, capital T, has been abolished as a dirty word. Aside from the constant features of cults, a psychopathic leader who makes others' sense of self and identity rely on his or her affirmative presence, this particular era, between the 80s and 90s, was precisely the dawn of the victory of capitalism. The decade ended with the semi-ironic declaration of the end of history, um, that famous essay. Who's it by again? Fukuyama. Fukuyama, thank you. And much of Shoko Asahara's critique the fatality of consumerism, the desire for a return to a simpler time, can be seen to speak even to those who would not release a deadly nerve agent on a commuter train. But given that for these people, nothing was true except the words of the guru, anything was permitted to make these worlds a reality. If nothing is true, anything is permitted. We have never been able, more able to curate ourselves, to take from the pick and mix of spiritual choice, to find out what works best for us, to choose our own narrative, yet we have never been more powerless to change the economic state of affairs. Aside from the personal bonds of family and friendship, the one thing this no such thing as society disavows is living for the unknown other within a rat race that has, in the words of Mark Fisher, increasingly functioned to produce a scarcity of time working as we all do for Zuckerberg or Twitter algorithms on the toilet and even on the home. So to parody what I've said so far, you might ask, what did the 60s ever do for us? Well, I will argue with a close reading of Mark Fisher that the 60s provided not just an alternative model of spiritual seeking, but an alternative for a new world. In his unfinished essay, um, Acid Communism, Mark Fisher said, the 60s counterculture is now inseparable from its own simulation, and the reduction of the decade to iconic images 
to classic music and nostalgic reminiscences has neutralised the real promises that exploded then. Those aspects of the counterculture which could be appropriated have been repurposed as precursors of the new spirit of capitalism, which, while those which were incompatible with the world of overwork have been condemned as so many idle doodles which, in the contradictory logic of reaction, are simultaneously dangerous and impotent. In his unfinished essay, interrupted by a suicide caused by the state of things, Fisher argued that late capitalist society, characterised as much as previous eras by drudgery, has increasingly functioned to produce this scarcity of time. The twin currents that we've been speaking about a little bit of the 60s counterculture, broadly defined as a world-denying spirituality of hippiedom and the revolutionary urges of the new left, between those that said change your consciousness and the aggregate consciousness of, of culture and society will change, and those who said stop being so politically impotent and strive to change things now, for only that will change people. Those two currents, though generally very critical of each other, complemented each other in one crucial way, <coughs> their combined rejection of bourgeois values. Any modern nostalgia for the 60s ought, therefore, he argues, not to be dismissed as a yearning for a simpler time, but as an unforgetting of a unique opportunity to refashion a society based on a deep feel for the metaphysics of politics. The 60s and 70s were characterized by acid communism, or he called what he calls the spectre of a world which could be free. Involved in this dream was an individualism um, which originally stemmed from a radical desire to be free with others regardless of the theft of time which drudgery entails. This individualism evolved in two ways. One stream into a radical reimagining of the social, of individuals living for one another without the constraints of time, and regardless of their sexuality or, uh, and race and all these things. The, in the other, it led to a solipsistic withdrawal into the mind of the individual. It was this latter stream upon which the eventual victory of neoliberalism relied. Although neoliberalism seized on the consuming desire inherent in fulfilling such expectations, neoliberalism, and what he famously terms capitalist realism, but there is no alternative ideology right now, uh, was actually a radical counter-revolution. So the victory of neoliberalism in the uh, early 80s, late 70s, was a radical counter-revolution, yeah? Um, um, to the, and it was not the seamless segue which it portrayed itself to be um, at the end of history <coughs> in the 90s. So neoliberalism actually denied most of what the counterculture had originally espoused. For instance, the libidinization of the financial industry prevalent in the 80s and 90s this fetishization of money would have seemed shallow to the widened minds of the 60s and 70s. The 60s and 70s, he argues, thus require an unforgetting, not a remembering, but an unforgetting. For the neoliberal victory of the past half century has kept us asleep to the real possibility of social change. So I'm quoting now. The establishment, no longer commanded by auto automatic deference, instead came to seem exhausted, out of touch, obsolete, limply awaiting to be washed away by any or all of the new cultural and political waves which were eroding all the old certainties. Where the new culture was not being driven by those from working class backgrounds, it seemed that it was being led by class renegades such as Pink Floyd, young people from bourgeois families who had rejected their own class destinies and identified downwards or upwards, they wanted to do anything but go into business and banking, fields whose subsequent libidinization would have boggled the expanded minds of the 60s, end quote. Working class artists, such as Ted Hughes, Harold Pinter, possessed and held the attention of huge middle class audiences. University towns such as Exeter during the 72 miners' strike and Bologna even until the late 70s boasted a visceral and unprecedented mixing of class, leading to a true socialist hope for change. Pamphlets in Bologna at the time attest to discussion over mechanization as liberation, and a real, as in uh, mechanization of uh, liberation from drudgery. 
and a real and serious number crunching regarding the universal basic income. The music, though also consumed and bought on a mass scale, was actually speaking of a radically new way of viewing other and being with other. During the 70s, working and middle class people had started to appreciate the same avant-garde. Culture was a terrain of struggle rather than a dominion of capital, he says. All those who worked had not undergone financial depression, and war was increasingly exposed as a cynical game. At the same time, the political left in the West had little time for such dreamings. So the, the left who are actually in power uh, had resigned themselves to a compromise with capitalism as necessary to maintain the freedom over and against the totalitarian states who were calling themselves Marxist, um, Russia and China, etc. The new psychedelic consciousness allowed, though, for a more honest look at power relations and a radical dreaming and imagining which came very close to manifesting a fairer and better world, only to be thwarted by the very powers that it had exposed, explicated, and demystified. So, a new seeing, a new thinking, a new loving, this was the promise of acid communism. How many new worlds had come into being then? What if the counterculture was only a stumbling beginning rather than the best we ever hoped for? What if the success of neoliberalism was not an indication of the inevitability of capitalism, but a testament to the scale of the threat posed by the spectre of a world which could be free? At this point, it's perhaps worth mentioning something about medical culture, or should I say medical lack of culture. We have the normalization the empirically t established short-term efficacy and safety in certain contexts, the discovery of these chemicals at all, we have the medical and pharmaceutical industry to thank. But let me follow this with a story which I feel is telling. At a medical conference, one of my friends, one of the more, uh, uh, he said that one of the more heated topics was the question of how doctors avoided boredom when the patient was under. Picture it, headphones, a well-curated playlist, a bed, the chemical, the brain, the trauma, and the doctor sitting idly by next to the bed, just to make sure nothing physical occurs. Many doctors said they were twiddling their thumbs, basically. Doctors were getting bored. Contrast this to shamanic communities or syncretic religions, where the shaman, um, where the shaman and the music is constantly there with, constantly effort-filled, constantly present. This, by the way, is not to devalue the presence uh, of doctors in the preparation and the integration of experiences, but it is to say that psychedelic experience devoid of culture is more easily essentially a drug experience. And much of the medical discourse, perhaps for historical reasons, seems to emphasize chemical, neuron, person trauma, drug statistics. And though this is deeply crucial, there is, it, it's, there is little learning from indigenous precedents. Ros Watts herself said at the Breaking Convention talk that two or three years later most people return to their depressed state of mind. And in a community, there are other people to uphold you. Um, maybe this is something that religions with their millennia of community building experience could help to teach medical culture within reason. We hear a lot today about psychedelics and sacraments this outward sign of an inward grace that I mentioned at the beginning. I argued in my first ever talk for Breaking Convention that this outward sign of an inward grace idea is perfectly subsumable to psychedelics. The outward sign, the lysergic acid, the inward grace, the meeting of God in the world, um, that is the phenomenon. Um, but a sacrament is not and can never be something as shallow as a chemical. To illustrate, I will quote uh, Richard Carter's recent public book, The City is My Monastery. Daniel told me about Brian, who had for 30 years slept on the same bench outside St. Andrew's by the wardrobe. Each week he visited him within the street rescue team. They tried to persuade him to visit the hospital, but he did not want to come in. Too claustrophobic, too many other people. This was his home, this bench, his ceiling, the sky. But over the years he learned to trust Daniel. Then one day, completely unexpected, <laughs> he said he would come. He was frail, his clothes were soaking wet. Daniel helped him. Don't leave me, sir, he said so politely. Don't leave me, please. He was wearing several layers of socks. 
They'd been on his feet so long they had disintegrated, had to be gently peeled away from his skin. Daniel, <coughs> Daniel washes his feet. That must have been difficult, I said. No, said Daniel. I felt so privileged that he allowed me to do this for him. It felt the most holy thing I have ever done in my life. It was sacrament. It was not long after that that Brian died. It was as though he wanted to prepare himself for burial. Do this in remembrance of me. This talk intended <laughs> to explore two interconnected areas of human religious life, mysticism and ritual in the context of psychedelics. The former can be maligned as a navel-gazing, solipsistic affair, inspiring for the few who are privy um, or understand, but generally quite useless at cultivating actual change within the South Florida society. The latter has been attacked the latter has been attacked by some of our more secularist brethren as a hierarchical smokescreen, a conformist play act. Are direct encounters with absolute truth possible in the pick and mix metaphysics of our Western society? Are organized religious rituals superficial performances based purely on hierarchy and mimicry? Far from it, I hope I've argued, but both are enhanced by being in dialogue with each other. Without the social ties and religious obligations, mysticism becomes what its accusers claim. Without actual experience of profundity, without a visceral feeling of something beyond, the ritual itself can become a husk of an event rather than the primary social event, a pale imitation of what it is to give in order to give. Both require one another. Without being inspired by the purging fire of ecstasis standing outside of oneself, one is not encouraged to love but without love for other, as enhanced by ritual space, messiah complexes, ego inflation, Charles Manson, Shoko Asahara, and those who must not be named abound. If we look up to bullies, we become them. Though the message of Christianity has become tired in our day and age, I'd like to illustrate how far our culture has come in its thinking about God with a poem. They sought to soar into the skies, those classic gods of high renown, for lofty pride aspires to rise. But you came down. You dropped down from the mountains sheer, forsook the eagle for the dove. The other gods demanded fear. But you gave love. Where chiseled marble seemed to freeze their abstract and perfected form, compassion brought you to your knees. Your blood was warm. They called for blood in sacrifice. Their victims on an altar bled when no one else could pay the price. You died instead. They towered above our mortal plane, dismissed this restless flesh with scorn, aloof from birth and death and pain. But you were born. Born to these burdens, born by all, Born with us all, astride the grave, weak to be with us when we fall, and strong to save. This poem, while moving, plays directly into Nietzsche's idea of the slave morality that denies the ubermensch their true power. But if there is anything psychedelics teach us, it is that we will not always be ourself. Not only in the sense that there is an inner other when we meet our expectation, when we exceed our expectations or, or fall short, but in the sense that the world itself may have a self, and this self measure, it measures us by the size of our heart. And in spite of the cynical skepticism of our politics, there are other selves, more and less lucky than us, but just as alive. Sacramentality is a sacred mentality. It's not reaching the peak of mentation, neither is it being seen by others as holy and perfect. A sacrament is no more a psychoactive, even a psychedelic chemical, uh, than it is a sherry in a silver chalice or a tasteless wafer. A sacrament is not just an outward sign. It is not just an inward grace. It's the union of both. We hear a lot today about psychedelic mysticism as experience and entheogenic rituals as social structures but we rarely hear them dialogue with each other. Uh, us psychedelics, are they at all about becoming a better person, or are they simply there to help us feel that we're special, improve our neuroplasticity, cultivate our individuality? 
If experience is a divorce from duties, if cognitive liberty is divorced from cognitive commitment, if freedom to mysticate is unrelated to freedom from having to create your own world, where are we left? We need, in the words of Barbara Meyerhoff, to rediscover how duty becomes desire. I contend that the our universe is anthropogenic. This is Rowan Williams. He said it's anthropogenic. It has tended thus far towards the creation of persons. Animals can be seen as persons too. Apes, dolphins engage in ritualistic act activity. Most insects dance. Trees speak in chemical syntax through mycelial networks. Some animals don't just feel pain, they probably understand it. Ritual is everywhere. The experience of the real barrier of the other the mysticism of not being the only thing with an interior life. Um, it, it, in the Anthropocene that we now live, the irony is that our world is being poisoned by our inhumanity. Infinite growth, finite resources, that's not who we are. That's, that's you know, as is often said, that's, that's the ideology of a cancer cell. In order to avoid this cancer think, it's not enough to say we must change our experience of life alone. This divide that, that, that tore the 60s in half, um, neither side was enough. We need both and more. We must change who we are through turning our duties towards the natural world and each other into desires. And this is, I think, most powerfully sought in the psychedelic mysticism of ritual itself. What if, as Mark Fisher said, the 60s were only a stumbling beginning rather than the best we ever hoped for. Thank you. <laughs>